we are the more uh, in the marketplace of it, or the lack of thereof. Uh, next to me is Tom Reedy, who I think will be familiar to some of the Kansas City people here, but is also a very good fantasy writer. Uh, I can think of Twello, uh, San Diego Lightfoot Sue, which he won the Nebula for this year. And uh, Tom, after kicking and shoving, would probably admit that he also was a fantasy writer, even though he won the Nebula. I don't want to put words in his mouth, however. And next to him is Stuart Schiff, Stuart David Schiff, who edits Whispers, uh, a magazine devoted to the macabre and the supernatural. It, it's a very fine, I don't know, I guess it's a professional magazine, although it's, in a way it's marketed, it's marketed sort of like a semi-professional magazine, in the sense it's not distributed to every newsstand. But it's highly recommended if you're not familiar with it. Now, what, what I've asked each of the panelists to do is to, what I want to have at the end is, is a fairly long question and answer session, because if indeed any of you out there want to kick ideas around, I think that's usually the most fun part of a, uh, a panel, at least it is for me. I don't like to sit and hear people expound for 10 minutes on their views on things. But. Well, well apparently, apparently Mr. Grant will be able to speak for 10 minutes. But, uh, <laughs> uh, also, I, I'd like to try and keep the panel uh, addressing itself more to contemporary weird fiction, contemporary supernatural fiction, because there is an heroic, heroic fantasy <coughs> panel on Monday, and I'm sure that they will get deeper into the adventure fantasy. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think of, in terms of contemporary fantasy and things like Lovecraft, John Collier, Richard Matheson, uh, Robert Block. Uh, Robert Block brings up a sore point I wish he were here because we really need a veteran from Weird Tales on the panel. And of course, he would have, he or Fritz Leiber would have been the ideal ones. But unfortunately, neither of them is here. I also, I also tried to get on the panel what I thought would offer somewhat of a spectrum of, of taste. I was talking with Ted White a little earlier, and we, we have somewhat different tastes in fantasy, so perhaps that will stir up a few interesting things. But first of all, I'll let uh, Paul Anderson give an uh, initial, um, which I say he'll perhaps tell you what he likes about this kind of story, why he's attracted to it. We only have two microphones, so if there's a lot of shuffling going on up here, bear with us. I like uh, the genre for the same reason as I like every other kind of uh, writing when it's well done. Uh, entertainment, appeal to the emotions, sometimes thought-provoking. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, weird fiction, whatever that really means, is more separable from the rest of literature than any other of the so-called genres, and in fact, it never used to be. In, in, in spite of Kirby's request, I would, to keep it contemporary, I would just like to remind you that, that um, practically as far back as uh, literature goes, uh, we have material that today we would call weird and horror. Uh, the ghost story has been always been very popular in China, for example, and even more so in Japan. In fact, to this day, the Japanese as a nation still dote on ghost stories. Some of them. <laughs> um, that, was our, that was a ghostly intervention. With a ghost in the story of uh, Greater the Strong, and medieval ballads generally, such of them as, as have come down to us in the British Isles or Denmark or a few other countries. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, fantasy fiction that, that I like the most uh, is not the, the blood and gore kind that's become so popular in modern movies nowadays. Uh, it used to be that you could uh, watch a vampire film, for example, and the blackout would come and the vampire reached the What's going on here? This, this is me plugged in the same place. This is going all the way across the room. That's why it's working. I see. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, lovely. Uh, maybe we'll get all the lights. Uh, 
definitely brings the hair on the back of your neck straight up. And, and, and its, its conclusion is just completely chilling uh, in its implications, which I think it says a lot about horror uh, as opposed to fantasy. Um, what I think makes fantasy something that I distinguish from science fiction is another word that Charlie brought up, which is mythology. Uh, what attracts me to fantasy I was always attracted to me to fantasy, I guess. Uh, those aspects of fantasy which plug directly into uh, sort of what you might call the, the, the cultural storytelling that is the tradition of, of, of Western man. Uh, fairy tales. Uh, all the, the descendants of what Paul was speaking of, the times when, when people treated these, these myths and stories as uh, metaphorically real, if not literally real, in the way they looked at the world around them, responded to it. Of course, we don't. We, we've got a very dilettante attitude towards stories about gods and uh, supernatural beings and so forth. We don't really believe it. We, we quote, know, unquote, that this stuff is all fantasy. Which was not true, of course, at the time that most of these legends were born. In. And uh, I think we get a sort of residual tingle when we plug into these, these old archetypes and so forth that embody fantasy. Uh, that's, you know, that's basically what I get out of fantasy. I don't, I don't read fantasy to be scared. Tom? Well, when Kirby asked me to be on this panel, I was reluctant because I said, I don't write that kind of story. So why, why would you want me on the panel? And so he began going over the stories and telling me <clears throat> that I did indeed write that kind of story. And <clears throat> you know, Gryak Twila has a sorceress in it, and San Diego Life Pursuit has a, a demon in it, and other stories have other supernatural elements, but that's not what the stories are about. That's not why I wrote the stories. I wrote them because the people who were we're dealing with the supernatural elements rather than the supernatural elements themselves. And so that's that's how I write fantasy from the from the non fantasy end of it. I don't I don't write it from the fantasy end, from the non fantasy end. The reality in it and how the reality is affected by the fantasy. And uh, that's just about my whole uh, well, I don't write fantasy. As most of you know, I edit a magazine uh, which deals with fantasy and horror. And my basic feelings on the subject, a lot of people consider that I'm a traditional horror type of uh, personality. The field itself stretches far, far much further than that. And I'd like to think that uh, I go from the hara, the traditional hara, to the uh, to the very contemporary haras of today, uh, espoused by someone like uh, Paul and Ellison. Uh, I was speaking to Tom about uh, whimper at whip dogs. Uh, I scared the hell out of me. Uh, fantastic story, and nothing in the traditional sense of uh, Lovecraft or Poe. And there are people that do that today, like Ramsey Campbell and Dennis Edgerson. They take the the haras of the mind and they're able to really, really pull you out and zap you into the wall. And I also espouse the traditional uh, type of unknown uh, fantasy, uh, dark humor, uh, things like Dunsany's uh, Jorkin's Tales and uh, the DeCamp uh, Pratt uh, Gavigan's Bar type of, uh, of thing. And you can you can continue on. The field really does stretch even a, even a little bit further uh, to the heroic fantasy, uh, as Paul Anderson does, and uh, Robert Howard and Carl Edward Wagner. Uh, we're going to discuss that Monday, but it's still it's still in the field. And I think all of these things really really tie in together. Um, and at least that's what I try and do in, in the books I edit and the magazine I edit. I try and bring all of these elements in. And, if they're done well, I think that's that's the key to the whole thing. If they're done well, um, 
that's what we want, not just to tie a tag on it, you know, say, hey, that's that's not Lovecraftian or you know, whatever. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think for me, there's there, there's a great deal too much timidity um, among people who not only read but are attempting to write fantasy. Uh, so many of them approach it from the idea of this it doesn't have precedence. And I think that's what's exciting about some of the stuff being done today. And I think that uh, I think that Campbell and I think Etchison and uh, some of the people he's mentioned are doing things like this. I think one of the scariest writers that I've ever read is Richard Matheson when he's when he's scary. And he has what Tom was talking about, this sort of fantastic things invading real life or, or things coming out of the corners and uh, and uh, I, I think for me, in, in a way, I, I think that's the kind of horror tale which perhaps has the widest possible audience. And I, and I say that viewing even some books that aren't good and some that are. I think of Rosemary's Baby, I think of The Omen, which is the number one paperback in the country right now. This kind of subject matter is, is terribly popular with people. And uh, I, I think that it's, uh, I think as Paul said, I think it reaches something very deep and very personal in all of us. I have, a, I have a point. It seems to me that, that in recent years, and I'd like the other panelists to comment on this, I, I think school would probably be the wrong word, but I'm going to use it anyway. Uh, I think the weird tales that I think of unknown, uh, the magazines, they seem to have tip, typified modern fantasy in, in many people's minds. I like things that were in both of them, and I dislike things that were in both of them, but I largely prefer what I found in weird tales. And I think the reason that I do is it seems to me there was a great deal more conviction and sense of feeling and sense of seriousness. The magazines I read, uh, hardcover, fancy press books, and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> to me, what was exciting about Unknown was the idea that, that Campbell brought to, the, to fantasy, which was definitely opposed to the traditional attitude that I think always prevailed in Weird Tales. I never liked Weird Tales very much. I sit right here and tell you that. Uh, I'm not a big Lovecraft fan. I'm, I'm not that turned on to what I think of as 19th century Gothic horror, which Weird Tales had a great deal of, although by no means to the exclusion of other things. I mean, they had Robert Howard, who was definitely not in that thing. But uh, the whole thing that turned me on about Unknown was that uh, it brought a point of view that I can, can only describe as a science fictional point of view to fantasy and what I thought was a rather happy marriage and uh, I see it reflected for instance in, in the uh, fantasy that Paul has done. Now Paul wasn't in Unknown because he was too young then but if Unknown had lasted another 10 or 15 years Paul Anderson would probably be one of the bigger names people would remember from the magazine. Uh, logic and consistency, and is on top of that a, a really good story to read. It has a good plot, a good adventure is going on, with characters of some depth. Now, uh, speaking of what conviction may or may not lie in the stories of unknown and weird tales, I always found very little conviction in the weird tale stories that I read because they seem to be very mannered. That we, we, we accept it immediately as our givens at the beginning of the story, things I don't automatically accept that readily. Mm. Uh, I think of Lovecraft, uh, and I probably read the bulk of what Lo Lovecraft has written. I did so sort of because it was in my way. Uh, I had to get through it to get to somewhere else, not because I was enjoying it for its own right, because it was so mannered, so static, so slow moving. People in it were not people I cared about. I passionately felt. And I, I, well, I passionate, one man's passion is another man's boredom. You see, and clearly you represent a point of view which is, oh, almost 180 degrees opposed to my point of view. And, and, and you know, uh, what you're getting out of the same things that we're reading. We're, we're, I, I get very little out of what turns you on, you get very little out of what turns me on. But do we want to keep talking about that? No, I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I think, I think we should move on. And uh, Oh, do you have anything to. Uh, Reflect upon that necessarily on what we just well, said. Well, Ted's remark that one man's passion is, a, is another man's boredom occurred to me that's what makes monogamy possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> horror. Um, horror, I would. Oh, well, 
I would say I tend to agree with uh, that also that, well, no, no fiction writer presumably literally believes what he's writing. I mean, even, even if he's writing a straight mainstream novel, he still knows the characters, that the events are imaginary. But um, uh, usually, though, whatever fictional constructs he uses symbolize uh, something that is real in some way. They might, in a mainstream novel, a fictional character might simply stand for a whole class of real people or um, a... Hmm? In a horror story, a, a ghost, let's say, that you don't believe in literally might stand for um, some real horror. Um, however, horror like passion, horror being a passion, in fact, is uh, very personal and so um, uh, what disturbs one man does not another. Uh, what, I mean, for example, one, one reason uh, Lovecraft usually fails to scare me is that personally I, I like the sea. I like fogs. I like sea. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, however, there are uh, a lot of um, horrors that we all carry around with us in an, an effective story will manage to touch that chord in us. Uh, well, for example, um, uh, uh, probably most of us in one form or another uh, have a very basic fear of uh, insanity, of going insane, L lose, uh, losing control of your own mind and soul. Uh, well, many of the uh, horror stories that simply show a world uh, that externally seems to make not to make sense any longer do I think if they're well done to some extent um, rouse that dread of uh, in us of being unable ourselves to make sense out of things so, well there's a the general fear of evil I mean e evil is real enough um, uh, Certainly, nobody needs to tell that, you know, uh, uh, nobody can very successfully deny absolute evil to a member of my generation, which uh, saw things like uh, Buchenwald and Borkuta. Um, there's a certain, for whatever reason, uh, most, pe uh, mo most people carry around with them a fear of the dead. Oh, oh uh, I mean, you, you think we don't? Uh, in that case, why do we not only throw the care of the dead over entirely to professionals, but we insist that these professionals root them up to look like wax dummies, and, <laughs> and so on and so on. Uh, a lot of the uh, these ancient archetypes that I mentioned last time around are still very much with us.